Hi, my name is Lavinia. This is Peter. Welcome to Games Made Easy, a channel to learn board games quickly and easily. Today, I want to teach you and give you some tips on how to play Catan Traders and Barbarians, an expansion that gives you all you ever wanted from Catan. What's fun in Traders and Barbarians is that the five scenarios open up an entirely new set of challenges and possibilities so that you can experience Catan in the way you prefer. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. Before we start, if you're not familiar with Catan, you should watch our video here where I explain the rules of the base game because you'll need them for Traders and Barbarians. In Traders and Barbarians, you still play a settler in the island of Catan, but now the Catanians have a lot more options because in addition to the five scenarios, you also have four game variants. The first variant is the friendly robber, which allows you to play a kind of Robin Hood version of the robber, friendlier to the less fortunate. When you roll a seven or play a knight card, you cannot move the robber to a land hex adjacent to a settlement of a player who only has two victory points. If because of this rule, the robber has no valid land hex to move to, the robber moves to or stays on the desert. With this rule, it's easier to get started. However, you still lose half your resource cards if a seven is rolled and you have more than seven resource cards. The second variant is the Catan event cards. Now this set of cards replaces the dice. The statistically correct distribution of the numbers reduces the randomness produced by the dice rolls. On your turn, instead of rolling the dice, use the event cards and draw face up the top card of the deck. The number on the circular chit on the card determines which terrain hex produces resources or activates the robber. Half of the cards may also trigger an event. There are a total of 20 cards with 11 different events. Those events inject new elements of chance and create a different game ambience. You can, if you want, add the New Year's card to add a little less predictability. At the beginning, after you've shuffled, place five cards face down and the New Year event card on top of it. Place all the other cards on top. You'll draw the cards as before, but you will start all over again after you've revealed the New Year card. The third variant is Harbor Master. As trade becomes more and more important on Catan, so do the harbors. Settlements and cities at harbor locations provide one and two harbor points respectively. The first player to collect three harbor points receives the Harbor Master card, which gives you two victory points. Similar to the largest army or longest road card, if another player has more harbor points, then they take the Harbor Master card. If you play the Harbor Master, the game ends at 11 points. The fourth variant is quite a big change because it lets you play Catan for two players only. The two players will also control two imaginary neutral players. Each imaginary player uses one set of game pieces which you place next to the game board. Then you distribute five trade tokens to each player and put the rest on the side as a supply. Build the board game as usual and place one settlement without a road for each imaginary player here and here before each active player places their starting settlements. So you will have six settlements and four roads at the beginning of the game. Then the two player game differs in a few more ways. Each time you roll the dice, you have to roll them twice in your turn. You'll roll once and apply the results to you and your opponent, whether it's taking resources or moving the robber. Then you're gonna roll the dice a second time and make sure that the result is different. Reroll if necessary and then apply the results for the second throw. The second change is that every time you or your opponent builds a road or a settlement, you also immediately build a road or a settlement for an imaginary player for free. In case it's not possible to build a settlement, build a road instead. This does not apply to cities or development cards. A third change is that you can use the trade tokens to do one of two actions. First, you can draw two random cards from your opponent's hand and you will give two cards of your choice from your hand. Now, remember that if your opponent only has one card, you will still have to give two cards. The second action is to move the robber back to the desert. These actions cost either one or two trade tokens. It costs one if you have less or the same victory points as your opponent, two if you have more. Also, you can replenish your trade tokens in a few ways. First, by discarding one of your face-up knight cards for two tokens. This could make you lose the largest army, by the way. Then, when you build a settlement next to the desert hex, you take two trade tokens. This also applies during setup. When you build a settlement by the coast, you take one trade token. If the settlement is both near the desert and the coast, you take three tokens. 
You can use any combination of these variants. Now let's look at the five challenging scenarios. Note that some of these scenarios already existed with the same name and the rules may vary somewhat. That is true for the first scenario, the fishermen of Catan, where the island of Catan is teeming with fish. For this setup, replace the desert of the standard map with the lake hex. Place the six fishing ground tiles around the map, one on each side, on a free vertex like this. Mix together the fish and the old boot tokens and place them face down near the board. Also give one overview card per player to remember what you can do with a fish. They're pretty cool. Finally, place the robber on the side of the board. He only enters when the first seven is rolled. The game plays pretty much like a regular Catan game, except now we have fish. You collect one fish token from settlements and two fish tokens from cities adjacent to the fishing grounds, depending on the resource number of each, and the 2, 3, 11, and 12 for the lake. There's a seven fish token hand limit. If you pick a token and have more than seven, you can return any token from your hand. For instance, you could return a token with one fish if you have picked a token with two or three fish. If you pick up the old boot, you must reveal it immediately. And if you have more points than anyone else, then you're going to keep the boot. Otherwise, you can give it to someone else. Now, if you do give it to someone else and that player finds themselves with the same number of points or less, they can in their turn give it to someone else. But whoever keeps the boot will have to score an extra point to win the game, so that's 11. On your card, you can see what to do with your fish tokens. With two fish, you can remove the robber. With three, steal a resource from another player. Four fish, get your resource from the bank. Five, you buy a road. And seven, you draw a development card for free. Just remember that you cannot get change and while you can perform several actions per turn, you cannot combine the cost. So if you have two, three fish tokens, you can spend them on a two fish action, but not on a four fish action in the same turn. Finally, remember that the fish tokens do not count as resources towards your hand limit, they cannot be traded, and they cannot be stolen by the robber. And if you run out of the tokens, just use the ones that have been used, reshuffle them and put them back on a new pile. The first to reach 10 victory points in their turn is declared the winner. Now it's 11 points if you have the old boot and it will be an extra point if you're playing with a Harbour Master variant. Now remember that the two player variant and the event cards will have a few rules that are a bit different. The second scenario is the rivers of Catan. Not one, but two great rivers that invite flourishing commerce, bridge them en route to glory and wealth. Set up the map by assembling the frame and place the three river tiles like this. You remove two mountains, two hills and two pastures and one desert. Then you place randomly the remaining tiles. Place the numbers as usual. Do not place the B, which is the two after placing the A. Instead, wait until you've placed the H, which is the 12, and add it to the same hex. That hex will provide resources on a 2 and a 12. The swamps do not get any number. Place the robber on one of the swamp lands. Take the three bridges of your colour, place the coins as well as the wealthiest and poor settler tiles near the board. Players start with no coins. Then each player places their two settlements, like in the base game, but with the following conditions. You cannot place a road on one of the seven building sites for bridges here, 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 or here. For each settlement or road built adjacent to one or two river hexes, you collect one coin. You could start the game with up to four coins. Now, and at any time during the game, the player with the least coins takes the poor settler card, and in case of a tie, all players get the card. The player with the most takes the wealthiest settler card. The poor settler card gives you minus two victory points, while the wealthiest settler card gives you plus one victory point. Now that we're done with setup, let's have a look at how to play. Upgrading a settlement to a city does not give coins. Building a bridge costs two bricks and a wood, and must connect to one of your roads. They can only be built across a river. For each bridge you build, you receive three coins. You can use bridges towards the longest road. However, you cannot use the road building development card to build bridges. Now, let's look at how to spend the coins. Twice during the turn, you can spend two coins to buy one resource of your choice. You may also trade coins for resources with other players, the bank or harbors. Now, if you hold the wealthiest card, 
and you spend coins and are no longer the wealthiest, even if you tie, then you will have to give back the card. If there's another player who has more coins, then it would go to that person. But if you all tie, then it will go back to the reserve until there's one player who has more coins than the others. The first player to reach 10 victory points in their turn is declared the winner. In the third scenario, the caravans, nomads of the oasis, seek wool and grain and form three camel caravans that could offer rich trade opportunities. Start by placing the oasis hex in place of the desert hex in the very center of the map. Keep the camels and the robber next to the game board. The robber will only enter after the first seven is rolled and placed on any hex, not the oasis. Play the game as normal, but with the following changes. Every time you build a new settlement or upgrade a city after setup, you place one new camel into play at the end of your turn. Camels provide big benefits as each settlement or city adjacent to a caravan route like those is worth one extra VP. And each road like this one running parallel to a camel counts double against the longest road. Camels are placed starting from the oasis and extending outward. A camel cannot be placed on the edge of the oasis hex. Each new camel must be facing away from the oasis or a previous camel and camel routes cannot branch out. Camels can also be placed near existing roads and new roads can be built near camels. Camels can also be placed on the coastline. Because of their worth, it is not the active player alone who decides where the camel is going to be placed. Players bid for it. For each new camel, starting from the active player and proceeding clockwise, players bid once for the possible location with wool or grain cards placed face up in front of them. Each card gives one vote, so if one player bids more cards than anyone else combined, he decides where to place the camel. If some players have a combined bid higher, then they can agree where to place the camel. Players who didn't bid cards cannot negotiate at all. If the players with the highest combined strength cannot agree, the player with the highest bid then should decide. Finally, if there's no highest bidder, it's the active player who decides where to place the camel. Regardless of the outcome, all the cards used will go back into the reserve. Now let's have a see a few more considerations regarding the camels. A caravan ends when it can no longer be extended or when there's no more camels in the supply. If two caravans merge, they will continue as one caravan. The first player to reach 12 victory points during their turn is declared the winner. There's another two scenarios, the barbarian attack and traders and barbarians. In the barbarian attack, vile barbarians are eager for booty and occupy Catan's fertile shores. Brave knights unite and ride to battle against the invaders. In Traders and Barbarians, your wagons transport fine marble, glass, tools and sand to help restore Catan's great castle. Both these scenarios are quite complex and I don't have enough time to show them, but I'll make another video just for them where I will also explain how to play the scenarios with seafarers and cities and knights. My tips to win at Traders and Barbarians are start by watching the tips I gave in my Catan video, they all apply here. As the scenarios go on, they become increasingly more difficult. They also will last a bit longer. In the Rivers of Catan, try to avoid at all costs to be the poorest settler because it's almost impossible to win with it. Wool is usually undervalued in Catan, but in the caravans, it can win you the vote and you can get extra points. So try to start with a good pasture. That's how you play Catan Traders and Barbarians. It's a great expansion to try different things until you find the variant you absolutely prefer. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe or leave in the comments a game you'd like me to teach. I will make more games easy soon. Bye now.